G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. I want to have a discussion about conspiracy theories. One world order, new world order. The idea of a gang of financiers secretly meeting to organise events on a world scale. <clears throat> First time I ever heard of such a thing, I was maybe 10 years old and I didn't really understand it, I read it in a book. Later on, when I was seriously studying warfare and aviation, as I was an aeroplane freak, I stumbled on another copy of the book and I stumbled on the same passage. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to read it to you. It comes from a book called Winged Victory by V.M. Yates. He was a World War I pilot and uh, he wrote this and published it in 1934. In 1936 he died from tuberculosis. By 1943, Royal Air Force pilots were paying five pounds for a copy of this thing because there was only the first edition in print back then because it was the only book they knew of that was written about flying in the war that didn't sort of overflow with bullshit. After the Second World War, well, who wanted to buy a book about the First World War, so it languished, and in 1961 it was reprinted. This paperback issue is a 1974 copy. So, after a few drinks in the mess, there are four people in their bunk room. Uh, Seddon, Williamson, Cundall and Allen. Allen's the noob. Seddon came in towards 10 o'clock looking pleased with himself. Feeling good tonight, inquired Tom. That's Cundall. You're a lot of weary willies, said Seddon, all creeping back here instead of helping the troops to rejoice. Aren't you on the early job, Seddon? Williamson demanded. No, darling, it's my day off. But what the hell would that matter anyway? Look, said Tom, I want to ask you a serious question, so pull yourself together and hearken. <coughs> Now what's bothering your baby mind? Tell me, for I'm sure you know, why did America come into this war? Seddon was delighted. Inevitable sooner or later. The immediate cause was the Russian collapse, putting the Allies in danger of defeat. You see, this war is being financed for the Allies by an international gang that works London, Paris and New York. It was getting hold of Berlin as well. It dominated St. Petersburg completely pensioning the government. Roughly it ruled the roost in the whole of so-called Western civilization and its dependencies except the Central European bloc against which we are fighting. It was getting a grip on these and that is the fundamental cause of the war. For there's one thing financiers cannot or will not see. Uh, they have visions of a frontierless world in which their operations will proceed without hindrance and make all human activities dependent on them. But their world state is impossible because finance is sterile and a state living by finance must always have neighbours from which to suck blood or it is like a dog eating its own tail. And as the financiers widen their influence it is the ever lessening group of nations to which they are fastening tentacles that bears the ever increasing brunt. In a sense then this is a Germanic revolt against the international Jew. In another sense it is a clash of financial despotism with industrial despotism. In another, it is a conflict of incompatible imperialisms. In another, a struggle for land for national expansion. <coughs> but the side on which America has been brought in is the side of international finance. Enormous sums have been invested in this war and an allied victory is essential to preserve them as capital. You must understand that all this money that is being lavished on war supplies is not wiped out as it is spent. Not a bit of it. It is mounting up as national debt, huge blocks of which are held by members and nominees of the gang. The associated powers have been defeated at the cost of, when the associated powers have been defeated at the cost of a few more million lives, including ours, and peace has been dictated to them. The gang will own a further hold over the Allies in the form of millions of pounds of gilt-edged security. And you may be sure Germany will be held down in the mud and kicked. There'll be a famous orgy of money snatching over our bones. To return to America, 
The danger of an Allied defeat, that is to say, the collapse of all that gilt-edged security, had to be averted. Those awful Russians, they let down their masters as much as their masters let them down. So the American politicians were told to be ready for a change of popular feeling and an intense war fever inoculation was carried out by the press. It took rather less than three months, I believe, to make the popular demand for war irresistible. That is the reason for the entry of America into our wonderful war. You asked me. <coughs> a silence followed Seddon's unexpected oration. Alan looked so overcome with astonishment that Tom burst out laughing and the others joined in. No, remonstrated Alan. Don't laugh about it. Do you mean all that, Seddon? Of course I mean it. Do you think I could make all that up as I went along? That's not the only way of looking at it, said Tom. Seddon mentioned a few other ways, but I dare say what Seddon says is about right. As a rule, the worst way of looking at things is the truest, and the loftier the feelings, the base of the real motive. And there's been a lot of lofty feelings connected with this war. The only thing is I don't expect his gang is either so definite or so powerful as he suggests, and mass movements of people are not quite so much under their control as he gives the impression. It is not easy to find entirely trustworthy partners in crime, and no doubt financiers don't hang together. They ought to, Seddon interposed, in uninterrupted amity, and I don't suppose they are so intelligent as all that. They have found out that money can be made by various immoral manipulations, and they work on rule of thumb. But you won't persuade me that the ordinary run of money grubbers understands the remoter effects of their actions. Sir Felix Goldberg is not Felix qui poitui re remum cognosciri causas. The causes of war are blinder than Seddon thinks. I don't believe that mass human movements are ever directed by intelligent control. Wars may be the outcome of greed, and of dirtier greed than even Seddon can tell us, but greed isn't aware of anything beyond its object and the techniques of getting it. Seddon thinks that financiers like war because they can make more out of one year of war than ten of peace. But that is a new discovery, and one that nobody suspected. Why, there was a financial panic when the war broke out. Don't you remember the moratorium to save the bankers' businesses? The remarkable thing to me is that America developed war fever so suddenly. <coughs> In Europe, years and years of well-kindled suspicion and armament competition had heated the pot but America had nothing to fear from European aggression and had a Monroe Doctrine as a cornerstone of foreign policy. Moreover, Americans were making unprecedented fortunes as neutrals. I expect the fear of losing all the billions of dollars that had been invested in the Allies was sufficient inducement for the American government to come in. But how did the government secure the popular support that enabled it to declare war? Even Americans aren't gullible enough to be stirred up by a three-month press campaign to do something so drastic as declare war on sentimental grounds unless the war feeling was already subconsciously there. It seems to me that human nature is inveterately quarrelsome and in spite of the outlet of family life it is constantly accumulating bad feelings of which war is a fine and righteous purge. But the curious thing is that it is not so much the people with bad feelings who do the fighting as their victims. To take American examples, Maitland and Selby haven't bad feelings about anything on earth, except bully beef, said Williamson, except bully beef and American brass hats. They are here because their country is in it. The people with bad feelings work them off vicariously like good Christians and by activities on the home front. Doubtless Maitland and Selby would accumulate bad feelings in time, but I expect the quantity would not become dangerously great until they were over military age. Of course, I don't deny that there is quite a number of soldiers with bad feelings, and they're very good soldiers. They have the right spirit, the bloodlust, and hate that military training is intended to instill, or rather to draw out and sanctify, instead of leaving dormant and ashamed. I don't like that depressing old doctrine of the wickedness of human nature, said Williamson. You admit it isn't in younger people who actually volunteer to fight, and if they didn't, they would have to. Patriotism being an enforceable sentiment, like matrimonial devotion. Do let a man speak. You admit it isn't in the young, so that it can't be innate. I think it grows in people as they grow older, through too much competition. 
competition isn't itself, competition in itself isn't bad, but we've made a god of it, and too much irritates people against each other. People individually are fairly sensible and get over their irritations, especially as there is always a policeman near at hand to stop breaches of the peace. But people in the mass, crowds, aren't sensible. In fact, they are damn silly. Look at our yellow twins, electioneering and advertising. Crowds are very irritable and don't get over it without bloodletting. They get worked up by the wickedness of foreigners. The big industrial blokes who are always being knocked about by foreign competition and their dear pals in Parliament naturally get very worked up about wicked foreigners and unfair competition. By the way, what is fair competition? And the more they get worked up, the more they compete, and the more they compete, the more they get worked up. The excitement is very catching, for it affects everybody's livelihood, and it spreads over the whole nation. The wicked foreigner is a very handy scapegoat when it comes to explaining low wages and unemployment. No wonder we wanted to fight the Germans. Their wickedness is enormous. Tom took up the theme. There isn't so much difference between individuals and crowds. Crowd behaviour is individual behaviour intensified by induction, to speak electrically. The individual doesn't get over his irritation without active expression any more than the nation does. It's individual bad temper multiplied by mutual induction, if that's the right phrase, that makes war possible. Young people are irritable, but they are usually happy, and happiness is the world's great disinfectant. What we need to stop war is a way of keeping people happy. Perhaps people are only happy when they are fighting, suggested Williamson. They're certainly not happy at this sort of fighting. An attraction of war is that it gives some relief from the deadliness of industrial life and morality. We have only to provide them with other ways of escape and no one will bother to fight. Gin, boars and Saturnalia, Seddon inquired. Possibly. The first thing is chairs of hedonistics at all universities. The subject must be investigated and a science or art founded. Compensate thwarted lives. Relieve the unhappily married. Away with protracted virginity. Instead of some people having a good time all of the time and others none of the time, ration good time so that everyone can have a spot now and again. That's all that sort of thing. Very nice, Tom said Seddon. We'll have to see about that after the war. I thought we were all going to be dead, William interrupted. Not for this argument. I was going to say that competition is deeper and more deadly than Tom seems to realise, and some of the fiercest is for what he calls good time. How the blazes is it to be rationed then? I don't know, but food is rationed, and that is more important still. It's nice to hear Tom talk nonsense, said Williamson. He's so good at it. But let's have a little sense. Grab is fundamental. However much we paint it over, and war is the only possible outcome when two equally strong sets of grabbers are after the same booty. War is fundamental and it only stops for a while when one super grabber has grabbed everything grabbable. Witness Rome. England has been less successful. Now who's being depressing about human nature, Tom retorted. And there's no need for grab. It can only exist because of poverty and lack of education. Bring up people in comfort and security and grab goes and with it war. Grab is barbarous and we are breeding barbarians by frightening people with poverty and insecurity and treating education as a training to compete instead of to live. That can easily be altered. You're a resourceful debater, Tom said and put in, but unfortunately your proposal to do away with poverty, for that's what it comes to, isn't practicable and you must know it. Competition in the labour market must keep wages uncomfortably low, and if you push them up by legislation, you kill the export trade. As competition can't be stopped without stopping everything, poverty must continue and war must continue. In fact, there's a number of powerful people who want it to continue. Seddon, you are a profound pessimist. It has been for 3,000 years a philosophic truism that nature is a flux and every second the world is new. And yet you say in a voice like an axiom that competition cannot be stopped. I expect you are drawing conclusions from a mere century and a half of glorious industrialism. Competition in the extra-human world is pure anthropomorphism. I mean in the sense of members of a species fighting among themselves. 
In human affairs, it is a purely 19th century notion. It was invented by pig-minded industrialists who made fortunes through sweated labour and justified themselves by calling themselves successful competitors. Competition being part of somehow good. A divine ordinance greatly respected by whisky prelates and statesmen, every one of whom had some sort of interest in sweated labour. The 19th is the hideous century of all English centuries. All its monuments show it was diseased. Think of frock coats, Mr Gladstone, slums, Balf, the death of young Dombey, and any other of the horrors that may come to, into mind. And don't sling Victorian stuff at me. There need be no competition to live. Read Ruskin. He was horribly Victorian, but he saw the swindle and it sent him mad. But you can't eliminate pressure of population. And after that, after all, that is at the bottom of competition, Williamson argued. Unless there is scarcity, population doesn't press very hard, and there seems enough to go around at present. Moreover, we can or shall be able to control population. It's a matter of education. But I expect population will control itself. The outburst that started at the end of the 18th century is just beginning to slow down. <laughs> The idea that population increased because of the Industrial Revolution is all rot. You might as well put it down to the Romantic movement in literature, which began at the same time. All three were due to one of those human eruptions that have occurred so often in history. Hyksos, Assyrians, Mongols, Turks, Huns, Goths. These peoples had no Industrial Revolution, but they multiplied suddenly and became a damned nuisance. These surgings of humanity seize whatever means of life are at hand. The 19th century gave to its own wave steam power and Protestantism. But the wave is breaking, and with luck we may have a period of glittering soullessness in which to be happy for a while. Then we shall abolish the causes of war. Back to Mozart. We shan't, said and contradicted. Say what you will, Tom. Industry can't function unless it makes a profit and nations either have to make a profit or borrow, and all the nations are trying to make a profit out of each other, which is absurd. We are up against an economic impasse. Hello, there's the FEs, said Williamson, who was getting bored. Farnborough experimental, type of a bomber. I didn't think it would be fine enough for them to lay eggs tonight. Lay eggs, drop bombs. Several engines started up across the aerodrome where there was a squadron of night bombers of the Independent Air Force, and soon an FE took off. While this was going on, Alan said, This is all frightfully interesting. You are the wisest three birds flying. Alan was a splendid audience. He listened with the most flattering attention. <coughs> but I thought we were in this jolly old war because of the violation of Belgian neutrality, or whatever it was and our reliance with France, which the Huns attacked, and it was up to us to do the honourable thing. Yet you chaps have been yarning away for hours, and haven't so much as mentioned all that. What about America and the Lucy? The remarks of Alan were cut short by a crash. That must be a bomb not far away. The klaxon gave tongue, shouting the air raid warning. Hello, the Major's got the wind up, said Tom. Let's put the lamps out and go out and have a look, said Williamson. And they did. About ten pages later, Allen goes missing, trying to stop the German spring offensive in 1918. But yeah, that's apparently what the Sopwith Camel pilots were talking about in their billets at night between going out and flying around 50 feet above a thousand machine guns. Back before they had radio, before they had television, the people who got an education, by gee, they got a good one. And they were so inoculated with patriotism and obedience and jingoism and nationalism that even though they knew it was a crock of shit, they went out and lined up in neat straight rows and died on schedule. Sir, yes, sir. Rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.